Good morning. It's a blessing to be here with you. Have you ever tried to put something together to accomplish something without reading the instructions? I know I have. And sometimes I get it right, but most of the time, something's a little off, I have some parts left over, it's not the way it was designed to be. This morning we're going to be talking about the book of James, the, the letter from James, and it's a very, very interesting and powerful letter and very important for you and I as Christians. You see, the book of James, or the letter from James, was written in about 50 A.D. It was the very first letter that the church received that we have um, with us today. And it's the first that we know of. And so it's 17 years after Jesus ascended to heaven that they then received this letter. So they went 17 years without having um, the written word of God of the New, of the New Testament. So can you imagine going 17 years without reading any of the New Testament? And, and at the time, they would have to have relied on the apostles and their teachings and people um, reiterating what the apostles and prophets at the time were teaching. And just from word of mouth and eyewitnesses, it was different than what we have today, having this collection of, of the, all the letters from um, the apostles that have been persevered or uh, preserved. So this first letter is extremely practical. It really is unique in its content, this letter of James. It's, it's an instruction manual for us for how to live as a Christian because it became confusing for people at the time. There, there was, there's a confusion about faith and works, and we're going to be looking, doing an overview of the book of James today, looking at this instruction manual for us to live as faithful Christians. So we're going to looking at faith that works. We're going to be diving deep to the book of James this morning. Several weeks ago, Brady, TJ, and I um, assembled a computer, and that was a pretty fun process. I've never done that before, and so we ordered all the appropriate parts. They came in from all over the country, and, they, and we assembled it. We put it together, and we had the power supply and the motherboard and the graphics card and all these other components. And we hit a few bumps along the way. We did everything that we thought was right, but then we had to update some drivers for some stuff. We just had to remember to plug it in correctly, make sure things were connected. And as we're going to talk about this morning, having all the components in front of you doesn't mean that everything is going to function properly. 2 Peter 1.3 tells us that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. You and I have been given the word of God and through Christ he's given us all things that pertain in life and godliness. We're not missing out. We have everything we need to be faithful Christians, to be true followers and disciples of Jesus. Everything has been provided. We have his word, which is true and accurate. We have his spirit, which we have received at baptism. We have our sins washed away through Jesus. We have the church, which we are a part of through him. He's given to us everything. But just having everything, having the components in front of you, if not used correctly, just like the computer that we assembled, if I don't plug it in, it's not going to turn on. Just because I have the power cord and, but if I'm, doesn't, if I'm not using it accurately, it's not going to work properly. And so the book of James is telling us how to use, how to live, how to, to work the things that God has given us. So there's many points of this letter. I'm going to highlight some of the major ones. But I'm going to certainly encourage you to read it yourself. It's a short letter. It takes about 10 minutes to read all the way through approximately um, but I'm going to highlight some of them. The first, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, we're told, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, 
and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So right from the get-go, one of the major things we need to be aware of, instructed about as Christians, is that you need to count it joy when we are tested. And that testing is not a bad thing. Testing results in us being complete, in us, being, uh, in us growing. Some lie that we constantly have trouble buying into is that Christianity is supposed to be comfortable. That Christianity is supposed to provide a life of ease and a full bank account and a healthy body and everything just being happily ever after. Now Christ does provide comfort. He is the ultimate comforter. Even the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. And, and comfort is found in Christ, but it's a different type of comfort. It's comfort in the midst of trial, not the removal of trial. It makes me think of what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. He tells us, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does, and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So we see here that the wise and the foolish both had to go through the storm. The wise was not removed from the storm. The storm didn't just skip over the wise man's house. The difference between the two is what they were built on. And the wise is only counted as wise once it had endured the storm. If they built on the sand and one built on the rock, and the storm came and the both houses stood, who was to say which one was wise and which one was foolish? It's only through passing the test, enduring the test, is that one is considered then wise. And the book of James tells us that we need to be steadfast in trial. And that steadfastness is then part of our growth process. In addition to this, we see the reward for being steadfast under trial. Later on in James, several verses later in verse 12, we're told that blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So there's a reward for this steadfastness for under trial, that this testing isn't just hardship that happens occasionally, but that for being a Christian, for walking this walk or following Christ, there will be moments in which we are tested, but that testing is part of the process of receiving this crown of life after living faithfully and enduring um, the, the hardship, the persecution, the ups and downs um, of, of walking faithfully. The second point of the book of James I would like us to look at in addition to, to being tested is that uh, we are to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Perhaps you've heard the expression, God's given us two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. Well, essentially, that's what we're reading here in these three verses in, in verses 19 through 21. Know this, my beloved, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filth, filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Quick to hear, slow to speak. And talking about anger. Anger is an interesting thing. My Christian counselor instructor at Sunset explained to us that anger is temporary insanity because you literally have chemicals going on in your brain that alter the way that you think, act, and behave. And he said, if you don't believe me, record yourself, film yourself while you are angry and watch it when you're sober and you will see that that's not you that you're watching, that it is a different person. 
And so we need to make sure that we are not angry like man is angry. God gets angry himself, but we need to make sure we get angry about the thing God gets angry about, not the angry about the things Mike or other people get angry about ourselves. I also think of Peter while reading this passage. I think of in Luke chapter 22, 49 through 51, where Jesus is in the process of being betrayed, and there's this band of, of, um, of men around the disciples, and, and they're, they're armed. It's a dangerous situation. And um, we see in verse 49, chapter 2 of Luke, when those who were around him saw uh, what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And the reason why I bring this to our attention is because I find myself doing this, where I'm quick to ask and speak to God, but I am not quick to hear his response. We see here Peter saying, shall we strike with the sword? And before he even waits this seemingly to hear what Jesus says, he just charges in with the sword and cuts off, we see Malchus's ear. And I do that all the time where I say, God, help me today to do what you want me to do. And I just go and do what I want to do. Or I say, Lord, help me to be, I want to be a husband that is loving. And then I react and think and do things that I think are best. Peter thought it was great to charge with the sword. But that's not what Jesus wanted him to do. And so we need to make sure that we're quick to hear and slow to speak while talking and praying to God. That we ask God for guidance and then actually look at the guidance that he has provided. So now going to verse, um, verse 22, we're going to see here that this is really the spear point and the major foundation of this entire letter. Verse 22, chapter 1 of James, but be hearers, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Like we read in the passage before this, to receive the implanted word with meekness, you and I have heard the word of God. We have, we have read it, we have it, we've been exposed to it, we have heard. Let me show you that you have heard. Go ahead and fill in the blank to, to some of these passages. For God so loved the that he gave his only begotten, that whosoever believes in shall not but receive everlasting. How about trust in the Lord with all of your, do not lean on your own, in all your ways acknowledge, and he will make your paths See, you know this. You have heard the word. It has been implanted in you. We have become hearers of the word, but now we are being challenged not only to be hearers, but doers. And that is what this letter of James is about. These, these disciples have heard and believed, but now we are to do and act and live with these things that we have believed. And these things are to influence and direct the steps that we take. You've heard of this uh, passage as well. Many of you have. Faith without works is dead. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Verse 17 through 20, chapter 2. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Your translation might say deeds instead of works. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Faith without works is, is not, or is dead, is not a legalistic term. It's not um, bad theology. We're going to see here that works authenticate your faith. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. Absolutely. But we see that it is the works that we do, the way we live our lives, authenticate whether our faith is genuine. Faith is not simply mental acceptance. The definition of a Christian in our country, in social circles, at least people that I talk with and interact with outside of the church, to be a Christian, all it means is that you believe that there is a God. And then after that, 
You can really believe in whatever you want. And then the way you live your life doesn't really matter. If you just claim, yeah, there's God, therefore you're a Christian. Well, we're going to see that just acknowledging that there's a God isn't how we are saved. That isn't enough. We see that even the demons believe and they shudder. That the belief does not save them. We see, um, or we saw while we were in Texas, um, Annie and I worked with a juvenile detention center while we were there. And we would talk about this concept of just believing in God, uh, that he exists, is not enough to be a Christian. And I would speak with the, the young men this way by asking them, do you believe the police exist? It's like, well, of course they do. But yet they've made choices that are against the police and what the law stands for. And then the consequences of that, they're in this juvenile detention center. And understanding that there are consequences. Likewise, just believing that God exists isn't sufficient, but we need to live our lives in accordance to what we believe and what is true about him to then, like we read in chapter 1, to receive the crown of life. Let me explain it this way. Think about what is your faith. Let me tell you what my faith is. I think it's probably pretty close. That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus himself is God. That the Bible is the word of God and is accurate. That Jesus paid the price for the sins of the whole world. That we have received his spirit through baptism and through repentance. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So that is our faith. And there's much more to it, I know. But in a nutshell, that is our faith. So the question then is... What is this faith that we just say we all believe in? How is that faith changing the way we live? And that is the works of our faith. If I believe my sins have been forgiven, how does that change the way I live? If I believe that when I die, I'm going to heaven, how does that change the way I live? If I believe that Jesus loved the church a certain way, and I'm told to love my wife a certain way, if I believe that, how am I loving my wife and, and living this out? And so faith without works is dead. If you say these things are true, but that doesn't affect the way we live, then that's not authentic faith. It's very similar to the parable of the talents that we talked about several weeks ago. The, the, the servant that received the one talent, he went and hid it in the ground. And nobody around him would have noticed that he had received this huge sum of money from his master. And likewise, we have been given the word of God. We've been given connection to God through Christ. But if that doesn't affect the way we live, then we are not a faithful servant and not, um, not validated to receive the reward. So I challenge you to see things for what they are. I ask, for example, why are you here this morning? Are you here out of routine, out of convenience, out of habit, or are you here by faith? It wasn't by our uh, invention to meet together like this Sunday morning to remember Christ the way we just did, to sing to God and each other the way that we have this morning, that we're going to continue to do so in a little while. These things might have become habit and routine and convenient, but in essence and in their origin, these are things that have come from God. And so I challenge you and I challenge myself to look at the things that we're doing and making sure that they're coming from this faith that we believe in and not from any other source and making sure that our faith is a faith that works. The third point I'd like to talk about is taming the beast of the tongue. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to highlight some of the major analogies that James uses, the Holy Spirit uses through James, talking about controlling this thing that's inside of our mouths. The first thing he talks about in verse 3, he compares the tongue to a, a bit that's in the mouth of of a horse. And he says, this little thing that's in the mouth of this strong animal, we can control this whole animal by just directing what happens inside of its mouth. He then compares it to a rudder on a ship 
And that was huge vessel, which is, which is given its, its, its momentum from strong winds, is guided by just this small little device at the back. He's saying that's how the tongue, tongue operates. He also compares it to a forest fire, to how this huge blaze can get started by just a small amount of flame. How many people were in Alaska here um, when the Big Lake fire was going on uh, a couple decades ago? About half of y'all, good. I remember seeing it on the horizon and just seeing all the smoke rising up um, in, towards that way. And if I remember correctly, that fire was started by fireworks. So somebody, unknowingly, lighting a match or lighting a fire had no idea that just lighting that firework was going to just incinerate such a huge amount of this region. Likewise, our tongues, our words, the things that we say have such a dramatic impact on the people and world around us. And that is what we're being told here, that this tongue, this, this little thing can cause huge, huge devastation. He compares it to a forest fire. Let me give you an Alaskan analogy. This one might help us relate to this idea. We're talking about small things having big influences. So this is a 30 out six bullet, and uh, it's quite small. I mean, it's not even the size of my index finger, but this, this bullet can cause a lot of things to happen. With this bullet, I could go hunting, and I could go and, and kill an animal, and with that animal, I can feed a lot of us. We could have a great potluck, a great feast, of, depending on what I, what I shoot, I suppose. A bunny wouldn't provide that much, but, you know, <laughs> I can get something. But I can provide with, to others with this. I could also, if there was someone breaking into our house or this place, and if I was to defend somebody... I could protect somebody, I could, I could save them from danger, or by not using what I have, I could allow them to, to get hurt and not protect them with it. Also, of course, I could, I could murder somebody with this. I could, I could destroy someone with this small thing. Likewise, what we have in our mouths, our tongues, can provide life to people. We can communicate the gospel and the love of Christ to people. We can be quiet and let people suffer, and let people run their own course. Or we can hurt and destroy and kill with this thing that is in our mouths. What we have right here is very powerful and very influential and potentially very deadly. We're told in this passage here that no human can tame the tongue. If you read these 12 verses, for time we won't go into it. But we're told that no human can tame the tongue. That every beast and creature on earth is tameable except for the tongue of man. No human being can tame, can tame the tongue. But God can tame the tongue. God can control what happens here. And if we... Submit to him. If we follow this faith that we have from his word, this, this monster, this, this destructive force of our tongue can be controlled. Jesus controlled his tongue, and he was just as human as you and me. So we need to know that through Christ, through God, this thing can be tameable. I think of in 1 John, we're told that we love because he first loved us. So when we see the way that he loved, the way that he lived we can then speak in a likewise manner. We're told in verse 9 and 10 here in James uh, chapter 3 that we curse man with the same mouth that we bless and praise God. He says it ought not to be that way. I love all of you very much, but I love Annie more than the rest of you. It's just, it's just the way it is. And there's some people that... Um, that hate me, not here, but elsewhere, people that really don't like me. And I sometimes just kind of 
slap myself in the back of the head because I sometimes speak to Annie in a worse way than I speak to this person who hates me. And I think, how does this happen? I love Annie more than anyone else on the planet, and yet sometimes I'm short with her and snappy at her or speak in a way that's not very loving, and, and I'll, I'll be praying to God, and then I'll complain or say something to Annie. So how does that happen? And we're told here it ought not to be this way. We should not bless God and then curse man who's made in God's image. And we have to make sure that we understand what's going on with our, with our mouths, with the, with the potency of the things that we say. I think of what James, our brother, who was leading the Lord's Supper talk here a moment ago, while he was speaking about um, when he was learning four-part harmony and, and the words someone saying, like, you're just not very good at singing, and that kind of sticking there. I remember a, a similar time when I was... Uh, when my voice changed gr growing up and, and my voice got lower. And I remember singing and I remember somebody commenting, saying that Mike has a lot of spirit in his singing. <laughs> and but, and they, I think they literally said that his, his, he's tone deaf essentially, but, which I wasn't. I was just learning how to sing again. And, um, but that was a long time ago. That was... I don't even know how long ago, but that stuck with me, those words. I didn't go home and cry and lose sleep over it, but to this day, I still remember somebody saying about saying that, and we're told here that the human tongue in this capacity is full of deadly poison. And I really like the analogy of comparing it to the bullet, but the, the difference in what we uh, see here is that a bullet is pretty instant, whereas poison is something that takes time to get throughout your system and then breaks things down and then is deadly. And we're told that the tongue is full of deadly poison. The words that we say might not be an instant kill to somebody, but over time, those words seep and those that poison gets in and death can come from it. Something I've realized just through life experience, I suppose, is that people are the best and worst part about life. My best memories, my favorite moments of life so far involve people. And the worst and most painful and most testing times of my life also involve people. And so people are the best and worst, but the things that we say linger, the, the poison that we can spread um, can have long-lasting effects. And I'm sure you can remember painful things that people have said to you. And if we are not heal healed by God, but we are not restored through his words, then the words of other people can be quite destructive. So now we're going to look at the last major point of James that I would like to highlight for us. And that's going to be talking about wisdom talking about wisdom. We're going to look at wisdom from above and wisdom from below. A definition of wisdom I heard years ago is that wisdom is the application of knowledge. So if your knowledge is wrong, then trying to apply that knowledge is going to be wrong as well. So making sure we have the correct knowledge is paramount, but then like very in harmony with what we're reading in James, being doers of the word, not hearers only, we are to apply this knowledge that we have acquired. So wisdom is the application of knowledge. Starting in chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Who is wise in understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. It stood out to me in studying this passage that bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are not just bad ideas. They're not just opinions or habits or behavior that are not very good. But we see that they're earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. We also see that when these qualities of selfish ambition and bitter jealousy, if they exist in our lives, 
that there's going to be disorder and every vile practice. Every vile practice comes from bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Essentially, pride. I like the way Robert said it months ago. He said that pride is the sewage pipe in which all ungodliness and filth flows from. And so that's why I put the picture of the sewage pipe there. Because this selfish ambition and bitter jealousy, every vile practice, everything nasty comes from selfish ambition and and every vile practice. Pride. So how prideful are you? I like the way C.S. Lewis asks the question or, or talks about this issue. He says, if you don't think you're prideful, then you're prideful. <laughs> when I first read that, I thought of Moses in, in Numbers 12, 3, which we're told that Moses was the most humble man to ever live on the face of the earth. I remember reading that. I'm like, wow, what a statement. And then I couldn't stop laughing when I realized who wrote Numbers. Moses wrote Numbers. Moses is the most humble man to ever live the face of... How did he get away with doing that? Some translations might say meekness, and so that's perhaps more, um, more practical and fitting to it. But if we think that we're humble, then we're probably on some thin ice. If we don't think that we're prideful, we probably are. But... Uh, Seriously, though, honestly, take a look at your life. Where do you spend your time? Where do you put your money? If, and I don't mean to be awkward with this, but if I was to follow you around every moment for a week and just log and record how you spent your time and how you went about your day, what you put energy, effort, and time and resources into, what would be the center of my report or if you did that to me what would be the center of your report looking at my life is my life revolving around me or is it revolving around the lord his work his mission and other people am i considering others more significant than myself or is this world around me am i wrapped up in selfish ambition bitter jealousy or or pride that's earthly wisdom that's demonic wisdom, that type of focus on oneself. So let's look at the other side. We're going to look now at wisdom from above, and this is just awesome. Verse 17 through 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace or make peace. It's a very, very different type of wisdom from what we were just reading about of the sewage pipe. And again, wisdom is the application of knowledge. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that his church is the bride of Christ. It's going to be those that are in the church are going to go to heaven to be with him forever. We know these things, it's now the application of that, which is this wisdom. This knowledge came from above, this wisdom comes from above. I want to highlight here part of this. We could camp on this wisdom from above for a long time. I want to camp for a little while on this aspect of it being full of mercy. In Africa, living in, in South Africa particularly, I would notice in some of the cultures in that nation that a lot of the women would carry these huge baskets on their head and they would be able to balance huge, huge loads on up here. And it was, it was really quite fascinating. It took a lot of skill and dexterity to, to do so. And I remember hearing, I guess it would be a parable from, from some of our African brethren about this concept of carrying this basket on your head. That we're all basket cases. He says that everybody has a basket on your head. And they say that you can't always see what's going in the basket, what the basket is full of. And he says, but you can tell what's in the basket when someone trips, someone pushes the person. When that basket gets knocked off and spills on the ground, then everyone can see what's inside that basket. So just by looking at somebody, you don't really know what's going on in their life. You don't really know what's going on in their heart 
or in their mind, if they're full of anger, if they're full of lust, if they're full of greed, of selfish ambition and pride, when, the, when life hits them hard, when they go through troubles, when they are tested, their basket gets knocked off their head and all that sewage pipe stuff just gets thrown about. But we see that wisdom that is from above is full of mercy. When there is mercy in our basket, when there is love, when there is godliness, when there is reasonableness, when there is peace, and we get tested and tried, when we get stumbled, when we get knocked over, that basket tips over, and it's just full of mercy. And it just, it just flows out all around us, all on the floor. I think of Jesus when he's going to the cross. And he's there, and he is being put through things that we can't even imagine. And what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in the midst of that pain of being hit so hard, he's full of mercy. That's wisdom that comes from above. And that's the wisdom that we are to have. So what's our baskets full of? What's your basket full of? When we're tested, when you get pushed, what falls out of what's inside here? Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody wants to do the right thing. And I assume that just about everybody here wants to follow Jesus and wants to be faithful disciples of him. We have here in front of us an instruction manual for how to be true, faithful disciples. I pray today that a harvest of righteousness is, is reaped by, by God through, through us. That harvest of righteousness is received by God when we sow peace. You can only receive true peace from God. It only comes from above, from Christ. And when we receive that, when we're full of that, we can then spread that peace, that mercy to the world around us. So as we conclude this lesson, God has given us a faith. And it's a faith that is to be working. A faith that is to be active. A faith that is to be lived out. We believe these things about Jesus. We believe these things about his word, about our father, about the spirit, about the church. We believe these things. We have faith in these things. These, that faith then needs to be lived out in every part of our life. I pray that we can be not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. If there's any needs here of any kind, we're going to stand and sing and you can come forward. and We can pray together as a church for you. Um, we also have elders here that would love to spend time with you and get to, to know what you're wrestling with, struggling with, to pray with you and counsel you as well. But let's make sure that we are faithful with what God has given us, and he has given us a life to live um, of, of godly wisdom. And it's right in front of us. So let's stand and sing as we continue to be doers of the word and not hearers of the word.